I was three months into Afghanistan. I was second in command of a group of eight men out on a routine foot patrol. We call it Overwatch. So it basically means protection to another group of eight men that we were patrolling with. Seven of the eight men in my section had taken fire positions and were doing their jobs. And I was the last one to get into my fire position. And I was getting down to my stomach and I put my right knee on the floor and knelt on and detonated an improvised explosive device, which instantly took off both my legs, both the knee and my right arm above the elbow. So Mark, keen to understand how you went from being blown up by an IED, mm -hmm. told you never walk again, to now being entrepreneur, podcaster, author, things that 99% of the population never ever get around to doing, even one of those things. What is it that holds people back? I just don't think that our current situations should... There's a quote on your website, so yep. I'm just going to read that out, So, which says... My situation and circumstances don't define my life. What defines my life is the meaning I've chosen to attach what happened to me and to the positive lessons I've learned along the way. When did you articulate that? Because it's pretty empowering when you see that on your website first off. I don't remember particularly where, where that came from or who was asking me questions and, and how that got spat out of my mouth. Um... <laughs> But yeah, I mean, I mean, it's true. I just don't think that for me, for, for a lot of people, that our current situations should define or dictate our future situations. Mm. Do you know what I mean? We live, I mean, it's 2024. You know, you can run a business from a smartphone. We've got access to, well, I've got access to the, the best technology in the world when it comes to prosthetics. You know, we've got a an abundance of information at our fingertips if you're on a smartphone, which everybody does. There's just nothing really I don't see holding anybody back, no matter what the situation is, from from going out there and creating the life that they want to live. Mm. You know, and this is the life that I want to live. Yeah. And what is it that you think, you've spoken, spoken to a lot of people, met a lot of people through the different things that you do. What do you think it is that stops people starting? What is it that holds people back? Fear, lack of confidence, um, overwhelm maybe. Mm. You know, I think some people are scared that they'll fail and get laughed at. Some people are scared that they will succeed and, and not know how to handle it and end up <laughs> drowning in the admin and the overwhelm of it all. You know, some people don't know where to start and that creates overwhelm. Mm. And then they just don't get started. They procrastinate and then, you know, 10 years go by and they're still not started. I just think you need to have a clear vision of what it is that you want for your life. And, you know, let, let's not skip over the, the early part of all of this. You know, I sat down and spent a lot of time working on myself and, and digging inside myself and trying to figure out the answer to this, you know, eliciting my values, creating a vision for my life, deciding what it was that I wanted to do in my life, then creating a plan around it to achieve it and then taking action on that plan. And mm -hmm. I've been at it for... Um, well, I just had my 16 year anniversary on Christmas Eve of being injured. So I've been running down this road for about 13, 14 years now, mm. you know, but I, I kind of knew you got to know where you're going, right? Because if you run 100%. 100 mile an hour, but in the wrong direction, <laughs> you're wasting your time. Yeah. Hey, Alex here again, and I wanted to ask you, what defining event are you doing in 2024? Something that's gonna help you get from where you are to where you want to be. For me, it's going to be an obstacle course race with Spartan or Tough Mudder. If you'd like to do the same and help you develop the physical and mental strength to take on all of life's challenges in 2024, then I can help. Because Screw It, Just Do It and Spartan, Tough Mudder are partnering up this February to offer you a big discount on their 2024 UK events. For Tough Mudder, podcast list can save 30% with the code TOUGHMUD30. Any 2024 Tough Mudder UK event for both distances. The discount expires on the 29th of February and starts on the 1st of February. Just head to toughmudder.co.uk forward slash events and enter the code at checkout. For Spartan, podcast listeners can again save 30% with the code TOUGHMUD30. For any 2024 Spartan UK event, that's Sprint, Super and Beast with a discount again starting on the 1st of February and ending 
ending on the 29th of February. Just head over to uk.spartan.com forward slash en. Both offers cannot be used in conjunction with any other offer or discount and excludes any of the other endurance race series or the Little Mudder. So join a community of normal individuals with an abnormal commitment to overcoming challenges that will test your physical strength, mental grit and aptitude for camaraderie. See you at an obstacle course race this year. And, and, we, and we all do that to, to a certain degree, I think. You, or you, you think you're going down, you know, down down the right path, and you you go at it hammer and tongs before mm. realizing. Um, I always remember my best mate saying to the, saying to me this. He was doing you know these three different things. He was like, I'm I'm off in in um, somewhere in the in Eastern Europe. We're buying a bank. He goes. Uh, then I'm in the the northeast of England. We're building like thousands of houses. And then he was like, I just suddenly realized I'm not actually interested in doing any of those things I was right. doing it for someone else yeah, yeah I was going at it hammer and tongs yeah. and it seemed amazing all these shiny things mm. but they weren't my dream they were somebody else's dream yeah and that creates conflict doesn't it mm. you know what I mean because I, mean, I, I like I like working hard do you know what I mean but it has to be on something that I care about and that I'm passionate about and I was going to say I feel very lucky in that I've never had to do a job or, or earn an income doing something that I don't like and I'm not passionate about. There was a very brief period in my life, you know, when I dropped out of sixth form college before I joined the Marines and took a job in McDonald's because where I live, they, they had this new complex built with a, a cinema and restaurants and everything. If you worked in a complex, you could access the gym for £20 a month. Whereas before, if you didn't, you had to pay a monthly membership every time you trained there and like some sort of yearly subscription. And I was like 16, I couldn't afford it. Mm. So I took a, a job in McDonald's and I didn't like that. You know, that gave <laughs> me a, a, a taste early on of what it felt like to to exchange your time for money doing something that you're not really passionate about. Yeah. So I knew when I was in the Marines, that was my passion. And I knew it was important that when I was discharged, I found a new purpose and a new passion and pursued that instead. Yeah, and I'm I'm really interested to to get into that. But before we do, just to like frame it, and you, you mentioned their 16 years uh, anniversary there, um, that Christmas Eve in, in 2007. Um, do you remember everything? Mm -hmm. Bits of it, nothing. Yeah, pretty much all of it. Yeah, yeah, it was pretty pretty intense and chaotic and terrifying. Um, you know, I, so the short version of this is I was three months into a six month tour of Afghanistan. I was second in command of a group of eight men out on a routine foot patrol. And we were tasked with giving, we call it overwatch. So it basically means protection to another group of eight men that we were patrolling with. Uh, seven of the eight men in my section had taken fire positions and were doing their jobs. And I was the last one to get into my fire position. And... I was getting down onto my stomach and I put my right knee on the floor and knelt on and detonated an improvised explosive device, which instantly took off both my legs uh, above the knee and my right arm above the elbow. An extremely, well, at least from my point of view, an extremely chaotic casualty evacuation then ensued. And it is only due to the extreme professionalism and courage of those other seven men that I was working with that I'm here today. Um, very intense scenario. A lot could go wrong, um, but it didn't. Fortunately, mm -hmm. everything everything went well and, and right, and they got me out of there very, very quickly. Um, you know, it, it was... <laughs> I'm skipping over the details, but, I mean, there were some pretty gruesome things I had to have my what was left of my foot and my arm that would attach to my body still, kind of cradled on my stomach while I was put on a stretcher, taken out of vehicle, fell out the vehicle, was held in the vehicle with my femur bone, died as the plane landed, got revived in the back of the, the helicopter using... It was a technique that had never even been theorised before, um, where basically if you're trying to get fluids into somebody and you can't, which they couldn't with me because my veins are collapsed because of the blood loss. Mm. Then you can drill into the casualties tibia and fibia, but I didn't have a tibia or fibia. They'd been torn off by the landmine. So these medics decided to drill into my hip bone. Ne never even been discussed in the world before. They just had no choice. They were out of, I had limited options of what you could get mm. an intravenous line into. 
And uh, yeah, they did that and three minutes later I was awake again. They'd already, they wow. classed me as dead on the back of there. No pulse, um, no, wasn't breathing according to them. Um, and then in, in all that chaos, they just had a, a really good idea thought they tested it and it worked thankfully so they, they were amongst the chaos chaos they must have been super calm i i, I don't know they are, nah. they are the the job that i did a lot of people say you know how could you do a job like that because it, it does take a really high level of professionalism and standards mm. but to me because it aligned with who i am it wasn't that difficult what they do I could not do. Yeah. I could yeah, not yeah. do that. I, I could not, I don't think I could handle the pressure of having someone's life like that in, in my hands. And, you know, I've met all the team that were on, I don't remember any of it, that part, but I've met the entire team who were on that Chinook helicopter since that day. And, and they said, and they, they always try to be polite, but I was just a, like a, a slab of raw meat, just like, you know, three limbs that looked like a pack of dogs had attacked it, just torn to shreds and blood coming out of everywhere. I was, I think I only had the top half of my t-shirt on. You know, I was naked, everything had been incinerated. They said they'd never seen anything that intense before. Um, so, uh, you know, from a medical point of view, you know, the procedure I just told you, you imagine how limited their options are. Yeah. Do you yeah, know what yeah, I mean? It's like yeah. we, the dude's got one arm, the veins are collapsed. You know, what do we do with this guy? Yeah. And none of them thought I'd survive. Um, obviously, I did um, because of their professionalism and their bravery. But yeah, and I think subsequently, the tours after, they, they learned a lot from that one incident and then went on to make some huge improvements in their systems and their processes, dealing with casualties thereafter. Because, you know, unfortunately, you know, I was the first to survive losing three limbs, but there were a lot after me. Okay. And they, they saved a lot of lives. Mm. Um, and I think all those lessons then came back here to the UK and, and other places in the world where they advanced their procedures and, and you know, systems and everything. So, um, you know, not, not the kind of experiment that I'd want to volunteer <laughs> for <laughs> to try and improve <laughs> the medical yeah. No, yeah. But, yeah. you know, like with everything, you know, out of any bad situation, if, if you look hard enough, you can see a lot of good. Yeah, you know, and there's been a lot of good come out of this one. Uh, and you mentioned meeting up with uh, the, the team there. What, what about the, the colleagues who are on that mission with you? Are they still uh, surveying? Or uh, well, I mean, it's been it's been 16 years. Some have, have left. Some are still in. Right. I myself would have retired after 22 years in October, just gone. Okay. So the only other person I know that was with us that day was the guy in charge who joined training with me and he's retired now. So that right. people would have retired, um, moved on, left, you know, mm. done other things. So I don't think any of them are still serving. And, you know, given what happened to you, happened to you um, and, and talking about the, the team that looked after you there, um, are you religious, spiritual, anything like that, or before or after? I think I'm more that way inclined now due to partly due to this but also due to age do you know what i mean yeah um there's life learning and i think so yeah. yeah and you know i do believe in fate if you like like everything happens for a reason yeah same like i said there were people before me that were were severely injured there were people after me that were severely injured and for some reason i survived and was able to rebuild and, and take my life to where it is now. And it hasn't been easy. It's been horrendous at times. But I guess there was a reason why I was able to do that. Um, so yeah, I mean, I'm just gonna, my, my plan is to continue down this path, um, continue building on what I've already built, continue doing the things that I'm already doing. Cause I, re I really have got a life now that I love living. Awesome. It's very fulfilling. Yeah. Um, there's a lot of meaning to it personally. I feel like I have a purpose, you know, and then you know, at, you're talking about being spiritual and religious or whatever, you know, at the end of the day, you know, when you're on your deathbed, I'm planning on living to at least 140. I reckon I could get to about 140. But when I'm there with my 64 grandkids and 28 great grandkids all around my bed, 
you know, I want to know that I squeeze all the juice out of life. You know what I mean? And I, I don't really think I have any excuse or reason why I can't do that because I have the technology, mm -hmm. I have the people around me, the opportunities are there. You just got to go get them. You do, you do. But a lot of people don't have their eyes and, and ears open to to even see the opportunity mm. that's right in, in front of them a lot of the time, eh? Um, what What is your purpose now? My My overarching mission in life for a long time now has been to become the ultimate version of myself, which is completely unattainable, which is why it's so perfect, because it means that you never stop reaching for it yeah. and improving day by day by day by day. And what I've found happens is as I become the person that I want to be, I attract more of the stuff that's naturally aligned with my values in life. Yeah. You know, projects, people, organizations, collaborations, whatever it is more and more stuff just ends up coming into my life that I have a passion for. And I want to take my life and my story. It's very uncomfortable for me to say this. Uh, I don't like saying this, but I want to take my my passion, uh, my story and the things that I've done, the things that I've learned and use it to inspire others. Do you know what I mean? Not in a way like, oh, look at me. Look how great I am. Look what I did. But I just want people to see maybe on social media or whatever, you know, look at that guy. He's got one hand, but he runs three businesses. Cool. It can't be that difficult then. Mm. And then they give it a go. And then they un uncover a, a talent or a passion or their new purpose. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? I don't think enough people in the, in the world spend enough time working on themselves to figure this stuff out. That's why some people I think are so unhappy. They work a job that they don't want to work to pay bills, you know, and they maybe go on holiday once a year if they're lucky. And they just in, in a cycle. Of, yeah, yeah. You know, do you know what I mean? And 100%. And I think a lot of that is people don't do what, what you articulated before, where they, they don't actually set a destination and then work out a plan on how to get to that destination. They, they let life make those decisions for them make like they, they, those plans for themselves I was, I was listening to chris evans on the radio on, on the way up and it's like you know what what is your plan for february because if you don't plan for february mm. february's going to plan you mm -hmm. it's the same with life if yeah. you don't plan your life someone's going to plan it for you you'd be running around doing you know all the jobs for for your business all the the admin tasks for your family and your friends and then you get to the end of the week and like what did i do for me yeah do you know what i mean yeah, yeah. what's fa what fascinates me about the world now like if if I was passionate about jam and I knew everything there was to know about jam, every flavor, every technique to make it, you know, every fact that there was, I could make a hundred grand a year plus just talking about jam. I could start a YouTube channel. As long as there's enough other people out there that are passionate about jam, yeah. you can get subscribers and you can monetize that. You can write a book about it. You can write eBooks about it. You can start a podcast about it. You then create your own brand. You then open your own store. Then you franchise the stores. And before you know it, You've got this huge jam franchise from this thing that you're really passionate about that's making you six, seven figures a year. Because it's all out. It's hard work. No, no and I'm smiling well, because uh, for those who are listening, because I love it. There's your blueprint right there. And, and maybe as we were talking off air before, we, we overthink these things. Whereas, as you say, those are the opportunities mm. out there on how you can you can make something like that, how you can actually take action. Yeah. You've got the vision, but then it's it's taking those actions, isn't yeah. it? And it's actually getting started, um, fighting through the fear, um, not getting overwhelmed. Um, and being and resilient. Being resilient. All the failures. 100%. All, I've got already this year, we're not even in February yet, and I've really tried to step it up, like doing things I'm uncomfortable with. Mm. And for me, that involves reaching out to ask for opportunities or create them. And that involves a lot of people telling you no. Yes. Like constantly, no, thank you, but not at this time. Yeah. Not quite what we're looking for. Uh, we're not in that space right now. And it's hard. Like mm. It's like getting kicked in the gut every time. It is. But it is. it's part of the process. Yeah. You know what I mean? There's a million stories out there about people who have been through exactly the same and they've stuck with it. They've been resilient. And then one day it all comes together. Mm. And then they everyone says, wow, you're so lucky. 
you're an overnight success. <laughs> <laughs> and there's no, no I mean, such thing. There yeah. is no such thing. No. Yeah. And, and I was not nodding uh, knowingly there because uh, it's interesting. Like I tried to do the same thing myself in January with regards to, um, you know, putting yourself uh, in uncomfortable situations. You know, one of them was, was physical, which was uh, raising money for a charity called My Time Young Carers and going in the sea uh, for 31 consecutive days mm -hmm. which myself and a, and a small group of friends did um, and that was that was tough that was as tough if not tougher than training for New York Marathon last mm -hmm. year that, that I did and it's you know we were doing it adding another layer of difficulty which was doing it in the pitch black okay. and then we had there's a kind of minus five week that we had you know that was tough but then um you know, mental side of doing things I'm uncomfortable with was again, as you mentioned there, reaching out to different organizations for opportunities. Mm -hmm. But it literally took me until this week to actually force myself to do it like three, three and a half weeks of literally it being on, you know, and I'm time boxing the day and I'm like, this is the hour I'm going to do that mm -hmm. and not doing it and just right. not doing yeah. it. And then literally I did two yesterday and both of them came straight back to me and one mm. of them was like um i work directly with the marketing team this is exactly what i've been pushing for the oh, last thanks. 12 months yeah. let me have the conversation both of them well let me get back to you next week because i'm doing this this and this but there's definite interest there and you're like yeah. just ask the bloody question yeah, it's not that scary once they come it's back not. at least you know either way right and then you yeah. realize it's not that scary it's not that big a deal and then you know it's like throwing darts at a dartboard, isn't it? You throw a thousand, maybe three stick, and the rest don't. Yeah. You know yeah. What I mean, that's just the numbers. You just got to be willing to face constant rejection. Yeah. And and I, I think, you know, those no's, if, if you kind of reframe that as well, it's like um, there's a yes out there for you, and you're just collecting no's. You're yeah. going to get closer to the yes, aren't you? But it's, it's that, yeah. you know... As you say, you've got to th you've got to throw a lot of darts at the ball, but you 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 try and want to be focused rather than be scattergun mm. in in that approach as well, don't you? I think. Yeah. yeah, I mean, I'm I'm also trying to be smarter this year as well. So, I'm hiring. I've got some teams. I've got a team that look after my social media now. I've got a virtual you've assistant. Really grown yours, haven't you? I saw it. Yeah, because and that's it. When we because first connected, I, you yeah. know, yeah. learning to let go of things and let people that are much smarter than I am do <laughs> the things that I struggle with. Yeah, and I don't don't just struggle with it because I'm not an expert. I, I struggle with it because of time, mm. and I'm not. I don't think I'm a very creative person. I, you know, you see all these people out there creating this content that they plan, and you know, it, that doesn't interest me. Mm -hmm. I, I'm no good at planning. I'm very good at doing what I'm told. Almost like an actor. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. You give me a script and tell me what I need to do and I can do that. But if you ask me to come up with ideas, I'm not very good. So I'm like, okay, well, how can I get better? I'll get someone who's smarter than me and more creative than me mm -hmm. to work with me to help me to, to grow it. Mm -hmm. And yeah, it's, it's blowing up a little bit now. Amazing. So yeah, just letting go of that, that uh, control. And, uh, and that's what it is, isn't it? Yeah, it's, it's holding scary. on to those things that yeah. um, that yeah, yeah it's <laughs> really scary difficult not to, to be in control. But yeah, you know, let go of control, and then you can grow. Love it, love it. Um, tell me um, a little bit about um, family, because uh, I was reading that when you when you had um, you know going back to two thousand and seven, I'm assuming you know you blacked out at some point, woke up um, in, in the hospital, and in a moment of consciousness you proposed to your girlfriend i did yeah tell yeah. us about that <laughs> so it was the 28th of october 28th of december and i remember i was choking on a feeding tube that they had stuck down my throat and i was when i say exhausted like imagine the tiredest you've ever been and then multiply it by ten thousand. I, I remember laying there in this bed after they pulled the tubes out of my throat and it felt like someone had put fishing hooks in my eyelids and put weights on them. I couldn't even open my eyes. Like I was focusing all my energy to my eyelids to try and I couldn't do it. And I could see like the blurry outline of the, the lights in the hospital room and I could hear people around me. And I think because of the drugs that I was on and the medication, everything was repeating, like echoing. And it was quite confusing, all, like, all these voices and you know all this repetition. But I recognized um, Becky's voice and she was close to me and I, I could hardly speak. I was just like murmuring and I did. I proposed to her there in intensive care and she was like, what did you say? I can't hear you. Say it again. 
And I was just kind of going, and she went, did you just ask me to marry you? And she said, I gave this little crooked smile after that and then just blacked out again and was out, (laughs) just exhausted. And then they kind of, they reduced the medication a little bit the next day. And I came out of the the coma a little bit more compass mentis. And uh, yeah, they spent the next seven days just gradually weaning me off this medication to bring me into the real world so I can understand what was going on. Mm. And is that one of the, those things then that that gave you gave you hope, gave you something to kind of focus focus on as well? Yeah, um, mm. yeah absolutely. You know, you got to have stuff to focus on, in, especially in situations like that where everything seems terrible and, and awful and against you, and you do feel very lonely. Do you know what I mean? Like you can have you can have fifty people around you, friends and family and people that you love, but you're the one going through it. And you feel like no one understands it. Mm. So having that that one person or those two or three people that are, you know, that extra little bit close to you helps to ease that burden a little bit. You know, having Becky there, you know, the, the nights that I cried during those first six weeks and she's there to, to pick me up and, you know, push me on, mm. you know, to the next next day and the next day and the next day. And then, you know, before you know it, the weeks and months have passed and you're you're out there rehabbing and trying to take take back control of your life. Mm. How, how important is family to you it's huge mate it's huge and i think the older you get the more you realize that yeah like yeah. i don't know th- this week and, and even last night particularly like I, I travel a lot i'm always all over the place with speaking engagements meetings this that and never and normally i'm quite good with it but this last couple of weeks i've really been like homesick and both my daughters rang me yesterday. One's 19 and one's 10. They both rang me in tears last oh, night with tough. issues that they're facing. Away. Like, I was in a yeah. hotel, sat in the Premier Inn on my own. Um, that's where I spent most of my life, just in a hotel on my own. And they were just both bawling their eyes out about things. And I couldn't, I'm 220 miles away from them. Do you know what I mean? I just wanted to be there. It's hard. You know, it, it's hard being a, a mother or a father and any kind of parent because you've got a try and balance being there for your family but actually providing for them yeah because i was having this conversation with my wife yesterday you know i really feel so my my grandparents before they died gave me and my sister twenty thousand pounds to get started in life and get a property that's what i bought my first house with Hmm. and you know now i've got three kids of my own I, i look at the world now i look at rent i look at food I look at wages and I'm like, how are they ever going to start? So now I, mm. I take that burden on of working more, doing more, earning more, saving more, investing more, trying to help them out. I don't, I'm not going to ever molly coddle them for it all because they need to learn lessons. They need to figure that out. But I can give them a little kick up the backside and a little boost to get them started like my grandparents did for me. Yeah, agree. Um, yeah. So it's hard to balance that being there, but then them understanding... And I don't tell them this. I don't because I, I don't want them to know that until the day that it happens. But trying to balance being there physically and, and emotionally with them, mm. but also traveling all over the world to get the money to do these things. Yeah, you know, it, it is tough, isn't it? Because it's it it and in in, in you, I know what it's like. You know, and again, know the travel lodges and the and the premier premier ends. Let's give them all their advertising space. Um, mm. But the, those kind of faceless faceless rooms. And I always think those that time seems to go far more slowly than the time, for example, that I'm speaking to you now. Those mm-hmm. hours seem to drag by and you could be anywhere in the world in, in, yeah. in those rooms, couldn't you? Um, and when you, you know, you have that phone call to say goodnight or you, you get something like that. How old did you say your daughters were? 10 and? 10 and 19. 19, mm-hmm. yeah. So I've got two teenagers, like um, 15 and 16. And it's, um, it, girls especially, I think, is, is, is a tricky age, isn't it? Um, She's at that age now with... Uh friendship circles at school Ugh, one yeah, minute yeah. you're popular next minute you're not and and i you know my eldest daughter went through that as well yeah and i think don't hate me for saying this anybody but i think girls are worse than boys when it comes to that the boys just like have a kick about play rugby and you know generally stay in their, their same circles but mm. with the girls one minute you're in one minute you're out yeah 
it's just it's horrible. It seems that way, doesn't it? Whereas yeah. the, like my, my my brother's got two boys, virtually the same age, and um, and my two girls, and it's like they just like thump each other, and then they're friends again. Right. Whereas I too, it just spins on and on and mm. on, isn't it? Be be that through social media, you know, whispering mm. stories, made up stories, and stuff like that. And yeah. as a father, you just want to go in there and create merry hell, but it ain't yeah. gonna do anybody any good, and it's gonna make it even worse for them, isn't it? Yeah. You know, but it just it breaks your heart when it does. When you just think of them at school now, at the break time, sat in the corner feeling sad on their own because someone's being mean to them and they don't want to include them. And you just want to go and scoop them up and take them out. Like last weekend, you know, she came on Friday, really upset my little one. And uh, we spent the whole weekend, you know, in uh, what are they called, like these trampoline parks. Yeah. And, um shopping and if you know anything about me you know i, I detest shopping so that's like so a huge thing for me to sacrifice <laughs> to go down into the mall <laughs> and get dragged around on a saturday um but yeah it's just it's just not nice no it's not and tell, tell me about um mark as a teenager then and um i read that it was your your father taking you to visit an uncle mm. who was a retired royal marine that yeah. it, it got you down that path ultimately yeah yeah, no, originally I was going to join the army. I didn't know who the Royal Marines were. I had a friend in the army, took me down to speak to the recruiter. And then my dad told me about my uncle. So I went to see him. And what he had to say intrigued me. But then when I went and watched the recruiting video, I was sold. Like, guys fast for up on helicopters, parachuting, skiing in Norway with huge packs on, patrolling the jungle in the water up to their chest assaulting beaches and raiding craft i was like damn these guys are like the ultimate all-rounders do you know what i mean so mm. you know from from the minute i saw that recruiting video that was all i wanted to do in my entire life so heads up to the marketing department they did a really good job on the video they, they did I, I don't know i haven't seen a, <laughs> an advert recently i don't know what their latest marketing trend is i'm actually in one of their recruiting videos oh yeah when i first passed yeah. out of training in october 2001 in november they filmed another one that went in the cinemas and because i was just hanging around doing security waiting to go on a course they uh spent four days filming a recruiting video for him uh, yeah my yeah. mate of mine is um is head of recruitment now i trying to get him in into the studio to kind of chat about what, what it's like you know behind okay. behind the scenes but uh, whether we will because of what needs signing off and gotcha yeah, 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 yeah. it sounds quite tricky mm. <laughs> or time it could take some time yeah. you know yeah. um not that he's reticent to do it um and what do you think it was you know so that obviously captured your imagination um as a, as a teenager what action did you then need to take to to get there and so that was it so quite an early age that was quite a um what's the word i'm looking for it looked quite simple in your mind like a to b the path is literally mm -hmm. like that i need to just go from from here to here what did you need to do to be able to get there i mean on a practical level you know my parents signed the paperwork sent it off went back to school did my exams muddled my way through some sort of training to keep fit eventually got asked to go and do a three-day course which is like a like a three-day boot camp to first of all for them to see if you're ready and secondly to see if it's actually the job that you want to do just having a little taster of it and i managed to pass that went home with one of their training programs and just spent the rest of my time training okay you know i was in the, either in the gym or pounding the streets stuck to this program to the letter and just waited for them to send me a a letter inviting me to start training. So it's pretty pretty simple, but mm. I think this goes back to what I said at the beginning. I knew what I wanted to do and nothing else mattered. I had no plan B. I burnt the boats. You know, it was that or nothing. And that's what kept me going through the training because I wanted to quit it every day. You know, I'm 17 years old, surrounded by men, like drowning every day in the, the vast amount of information and, and the pace of life. And I lived 45 minutes away from camp. So I thought I could be home in my bed for an hour hmm. every day. It was so tempting. But I just didn't know what I would do if I quit. And I managed to somehow like project myself forward in time. Because where we do our training, it's got a dedicated train station. Um, so you go to Exit St. David's and you get this little bone rattler and it turns up and it's at the bottom field where the assault course is. Okay. It's just dedicated for camp. And I, I could see myself sat on the train looking into camp with guys running around doing the ropes and the assault courses 
and I could feel the feelings that when that train went, you know, choo choo, and I felt the wheel move, that I'd feel instant regret mm. if I quit. Yeah, and that kept me there the whole time. Did it? Like, no matter how low I got, I could, I could feel. I knew what it would feel like the second that train pulled away. I'd, I'd think, no, I've made a mistake, and then I have to go home, explain that I didn't have what it take to make it, face my uncle. It would just mm. like, in my mind, he'd be ashamed of me <laughs> and then go, okay, what do I do now? Do I go back to McDonald's? I, I don't know. What, what's the deal? Yeah. And I, I just, it, that's a powerful motivator if you've got no plan B. It is. And, and is that something that you, you carry on through with you now? I, in certain areas of my life, I do, yeah. Yeah. If I've got to be hyper-focused, um, like when I competed in the Invictus Games, it was very similar. Right. It was like, this is my priority right now. Nothing else matters, not not fun, no excitement. You know, if some crazy opportunity came across my desk, then I'd have to rethink things. But I was just hyper-focused on winning gold medals, you know, and, and just doing whatever it took to do that. And you did. Yeah, yeah, four of them, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Thought we'd get that in there. Yeah. Amazing. And what was the, the training like for that? For the games? Yeah. A lot of it's really down to you as an individual. So I had a full-time job at the time. Mm. So I'd get up at five in the morning. I would bum walk down to my garage and I had a my hand bike on a terrible trainer and a rowing machine. And it was it was freezing in this garage. It was so hard to like drag yourself down there every morning. And I'd do cardio. Then I'd go to work. Then I'd do strength and conditioning in the evening. And then on the weekends, you have to travel the country to... I think we were in Bath, Liverpool, Manchester, Edinburgh, Plymouth, Bristol, like all over the place to do sports specific camps. So uh, okay. rowing, swimming, hand cycling, whatever it was. But they're all over the country. So you'd go there for like three days over the weekend. So it was exhausting. Mm. Like you're just working all week, training twice a week, three, four times a day, then traveling to camps on weekends. So it, it was exhausting. But like I said, it was, I was hyper focused on it. And that was all I cared about in that period was just getting those medals and then moving on to the next thing. Mm, and that kind of fear of failure drove you on? Yeah, I think so. I, I just, I wanted to go into something that I'd never really done before and come out with the top prize. Mm. You know what I mean? Just to see if I could. Yeah. Mm. And, and what about when it's different when you, you're not in control of the plan and when you you know, woke up in hospital and, you know, I'm assuming, you know, they put a plan together for you for your rehab to get you from, from A to B again. How is that different with, with your mindset of, like, trusting those experts to get you from where you need to be? Well, it was a bit of a collaboration. So within three weeks, I was doing rehab in my hospital bed. Once I'd learned how to sit up in bed, because I only had, the use of two fingers initially because I had a huge hole in my hand from a shrapnel wound. Wow. Once I'd learned to sit up and balance, we got a like a table tennis paddle and a balloon and I would sit on the end of the bed and my physio would put it in and I'd have to reach out far and tap it and start engaging my core. Okay. Because they explained that the muscles I now needed to walk were very different to the ones I used before. Mm. So I started, they didn't want me to do any of that. This is what I'm saying. It's a collaboration. I convinced them. And then we started collaborating on rehab going forward. Okay. And, uh, you know, that there was a point when I left hospital and went into rehab and was learning to walk again where I had to go against the grain. So, no, I was the first triple amputee since I think the first, maybe the Second World War. No one had dealt with me before. Every day was difficult. Every day they we had to figure out what to do because no one had walked that path before me. Mm. And I found someone in America who was a triple amputee who was living completely independently, like no wheelchair, no carers, swimming, mm. running, all of it. And I asked to go meet him, and they said no. And the short version of this is I went anyway. Right. I went, I went AWOL from the military for three weeks on the 9th of June 2009 <laughs> because I knew that I had to take control of my rehab at that point if I wanted to have an independent and fulfilling future, I couldn't keep 
wading through treacle, trying to figure it out myself. I had to go somewhere, find someone who's been there, seen it, done it, and come out the other side and learn from them. Yeah, it totally makes sense to me. And that's yeah. what I did. Like yeah. him and his team, his name's Cameron. Cameron and his team had been doing this for six years, like living as a triple amputee, pushing the boundaries, doing the things that everyone tell them wasn't possible. The things that I was getting told weren't possible with my level of amputations. Mm. He was doing them. So I'm like, well, let me go learn from this guy then. And yeah. then I can bring this back and we can teach other people because there were other triples and doubles coming through the system at that point. But they said no. And, uh, you know, I didn't just go, you know, F you, I'm going. Yeah. It took a couple of weeks of waking up at two, three in the morning, having conversations with my wife about what the right thing to do is. Because I'm a soldier, you know, you got to do what you're told. Mm. But I think we both agreed in the end, like 10 years time, none of these people will be in my life. So I'll go. I'll get disciplined when I come back and then I'll just leave anyway. So that's what I did. I went 9th of June, 2009, never used a wheelchair since, you know, and when I was in hospital, I got told I had zero chance of ever being able to walk. Yeah. Read so, that. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. And, and when you receive news like that, how does your brain process that? Well, I mean, when I was told that back in hospital, I, I wanted to take my own life. That's the serious side of this. You know, I was 24 years old. I went from being six foot two, 16 stone, the peak of my physical fitness, to being 24 years old, three foot five, less than nine stone in weight, with, in my mind back then, no future at 24 years old. Mm. And then being told by a, a professional that I'll never walk again made it even worse. You know, so I went through a four or five days of, anger, bitterness, depression, you know, all, all of that. And then eventually got out of it. And, uh, you know, there, there was one other time in that first six weeks, it was the, the first time I saw myself in a full length mirror. Right. You know, I spent the whole night crying with Becky in, in a flat outside the hospital. But then literally those two times were, were like the lowest I've been. And everything since then has just been right. Give me a go, get on my way, let's go. And that's it. Like, and that's, that's, for me, is the magic formula. You know, I had a purpose. I set my goals. I got good people around me. Over the months and years, I started getting rid of all the, what I call morale vampires. The ones saying, oh, you can't do that, Mark, because your amputations are, you know, they'll limit you doing this, you limit you doing that. I'm like, find me someone that is going to help me try. Mm. Yeah, and I'll just start, like, replacing people. It sounds brutal. But no, but Just you, replacing you people yeah. or limiting the time I spend with them. And then life just took off. Do you know what I mean? It's not that difficult of a formula, really. You know, have a purpose, know what you want, set your goals, create a plan, get around good people, take action. And also something you said earlier, um, I wanted to touch on as well, being fulfilled in doing that mm -hmm. is, is key as well, isn't it? Yeah. You have to find fulfillment because otherwise it doesn't align with the purpose, does it? No. And, you know, I find a lot of fulfillment in my own personal development. Mm -hmm. So like we're talking about like the failures, the no's, the getting back up. In the beginning, when you, you look at it very differently and, and it's hard to understand, but then as you get older and wiser, you read more books, meet successful people, understand the game a little bit better, you start to embrace all that. You're like, okay, cool, no, happy days. On to the next one, on to the next one. Oh, I failed that. Oh, what did I learn? Okay, let's test, adjust, move on, try again, go. And you enjoy the process more and you go to bed at night smiling. Like, because even if you didn't, achieve anything you wanted to in that day, you've grown as a person, you've learned something, and then you understand that's what it's really all about. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. So it's fun. Even even when you fail, you win. Agreed. It's a, it, it's, a, it's just a lesson. Is the mm -hmm. way. Whereas, you know, me, 10 years ago, coming out of, you know, corporate life at Virgin for 17 years, the, the first time I tried to start a business, which, which ultimately you know, failed, tried to grow too quickly. Um, at the time, it was the worst thing in the world that could have happened to me, like the shame, you mm. know, everything fell to pieces uh, around me, you know, um, couldn't couldn't pay the bills, couldn't look after the, the family, you know, mm. in, my, in my mind. And then afterwards, now I look back and go, I would love to meet the, the, the guy back then who'd, um, you know, sold me this dream that then, you know, quickly quickly turned to ashes and, and I kind of tried to grow too quickly. It was like sports injury clinics that, that, that we had, um, tried to, you know, grow 
road too quickly. But now I look back and go, I'd like to meet him, shake his hand and say, thank you for sharing this, you know, the best lesson I've ever received in yeah. my life. Yeah. You know, sometimes um, they're expensive lessons, very. but they all add to the story. <laughs> they do. Because you know, when you do, you know, hit that, that peak you want to hit, you can share these stories. And I, I find they help. This is, this is what's helped me listen to other people's stories about whether it's their rehab, whether it's business, whether it's sport, whatever it is, listening to their journeys that they've been through. You, I get a lot from people that are very open and, and raw and honest. Mm. You know, I think you can learn a lot from that. So this is why I do all this kind of stuff in social media, because I'd like to be open and raw and honest and share my failures and shortcomings so that if anyone else is going through it, yeah, they go, oh, okay, actually, it's part of the process. It's natural. Mm. You know, keep on going. It it it's tough being vulnerable, I find. But you you see how much more engagement you get with people mm. when you do that for for the exact reasons that, that you mentioned. Because mm. people, if you, if you're having those thoughts, and and then you guarantee it, there's other people who are having exactly the same thoughts mm. out there at the same time. And that's what you got to focus on, right? Mm. It's quite funny. Never in. 15 plus years have been on social media have i ever received trolls or haters except for the last like six months really and in the beginning it used to make me angry yeah and then I, and i'm like i bet if this person saw me face to face they wouldn't say this yeah you know what i mean but now i get to that point now when i i actually again embrace it and enjoy it because i don't i, I genuinely don't care like when you sit back and think about it like i you know i had a a kid the other day is about 20 trying to give me parenting advice because he saw a poster put up with my son and told me I was a terrible parent. So I was like, well, what would you have done with your child in that situation? Well, I haven't got any kids. Well, <laughs> why am I listening <laughs> to you? Why are you giving advice? Why do I care what you've got to say? Yeah. Do you know yeah. what I mean? But it's it's all part mm. of that that journey. And if you don't have people trolling you and giving you, you stick online, you're not reaching enough people. And the yes. people that I want to reach what we're talking about, the ones that you can help, they you'll get on their radar eventually. Mm. So they're actually helping you achieve your objective anyway. Someone we were talking about off air before, Rob Moore's got some good stories with trolls. No, I, I know, yeah. No, Rob's great. <laughs> Rob's great. He, I love that. He's, he's very thick-skinned. Yeah. Yeah. He's, he's, he's learned to be, hasn't he? Um, who, um, other than Rob maybe, who, who in the, you know, the vast network of people that you must have met over, you know, last... 10, 15, 20 years, um, who's been really important that you've met that, you know, life lessons, business lessons that you've, um, you've taken on board? Um, I don't know. I've, I've got a lot of friends and acquaintances in, you know, the business world, the corporate, but it's, it's my close friends, really guys that I serve with that I still work with now that, I can pick the phone up to when I'm struggling and going through a hard time and they give me like genuinely good advice. Mm -hmm. Do you know what I mean? And they, they, and they mean it and they actually give me the time to, to chat. It's not one of these, uh, you know, just, just do this, Mark, get on with it, mate, and you'll be fine. None of, none of that rubbish. But people, I don't want to embarrass them by saying who they are. Um, but since Christmas, I've been having a bit of an issue. I just struggled. Like, you know, I just said, I, said I don't care, but, you know, the trolls, I think my son sees some of that stuff and right. I leave it up unless mm. it's like really inappropriate. I'll, I'll leave it up there because then I'll, I'll say to him the same thing I was saying to you, like, don't, don't worry about that. Ignore those people. But, you know, sometimes it gets to you. Yeah. And sometimes you need a bit of an offload. Sometimes you don't think the world's fair. Sometimes the no's you're getting do get to you a little bit and you're like, oh, God, I need to offload on someone. Mm. And then I've got that good group of lads that i can do that to just like they would with me yeah do you know what i mean they're the most important people you know those those close friends and, and family and why do you think is there any rhyme or reason like the last six months that after having like no trolls for a decade or so is it because you're you're putting more out there you're trying so. to reach yeah it's just the pushing out my comfort zone more yeah get, getting out there on social media more no this is the thing not everyone's going to agree mm. with my points of view. Sometimes I might say something that's really stupid. You know, if, if I'm putting myself out there, I kind of have to accept that not everyone's going to agree with me. But that's cool. You know, the world will be boring. I think when you do put stuff out there that attracts trolls, I think at the same time it attracts your tribe as well and the people that do agree and align with your values and 
think the same as you do. And yeah. you wouldn't have found those people had you not put that video or that tweet out or whatever it is. Yeah. And I don't, I don't do anything like controversial. Do you know what I mean? I'm, I don't go out putting out hate comments or anything like that. Mm. But, you know, I'm ex-military. It's, it's bizarre, but I've seen people recently just giving me stick for that <laughs> saying oh, i'm a murderer and all this kind of stuff oh I'm, my like, God, I'm just like dude i joined the military to serve my country and to help people yeah and then you've got like these these young people going oh you're you're a scumbag and i'm like hmm okay cool and, and, and why take the time to even write that move on find something yeah. that you're into I, yeah. I, I don't understand the mindset no, but me you know neither, but you know, it is what it is. It is. It is, Mark. Um, and tell me, was there, you know, a, a screw it, just do it moment um, that ultimately took you from from where you were in that hospital back in 2007 to doing what you're doing today and clearly reaching a lot more people with, with your message and your purpose? I think it happened for me very early on in, in my recovery. It was a big mindset shift for me, which... I guess is screw it, just do it. But so when I was injured, my unit was still deployed and they had a month left in theatre. Then they would come back and have 10 weeks leave. And then we'd go back to our unit and have a medals parade where a VIP would come along. The whole unit would be formed up on the parade square. Friends, family, relatives from all over the world would come and watch. It's a big deal. Everyone expected me to be pushed on the parade ground in a wheelchair. Mm. But I said screw it, just do it. I'm going to walk. It, it'll be ugly. It'll be painful. Uh, it, I'll look terrible because I was early on in my recovery. But I was like, screw it. That's my goal. I'm going to do that. And when I achieved that, that early on in my recovery, I had this epiphany that that was kind of the way I'd like do everything. Just screw it, just do it. Set a goal, go for it. And I, I did that in every area of my life, my health, fitness, finances, career, everything. I just started setting all, you know, big goals, small goals, short term, long term. And just, it, came, it became a bit, little bit obsessive at some point. But it, what hmm. I found was that it kept me on a very positive track. And it, it stopped me, because I wasn't sitting still for very long, I couldn't get into a negative headspace. Yeah, And I yeah. just kept moving forward, keep moving forward, kept moving forward all the time. Hmm. Um. And there, that, that was just from that early stage was the mindset that I'd adopted from the beginning. Um, and from then to, to now, um, you must have had setbacks along the way because everybody does. Mm. What kind of setbacks have you had to overcome? <laughs> Believe it or not, I, I broke my femur um, doing jujitsu. Oh, I was going to say, I had to do it? crawl okay. around on my stomach in my house for three weeks. Um, and then six weeks in total, just laying on my daughter's bedroom floor, unable to navigate around my house. Then I broke my finger as well when I tripped and karate chopped the cupboard and snapped my, <laughs> my bone there, so I had a splint on, so I couldn't even type at that Ugh. point. But it's funny, when when those things happen, like when I couldn't type, I, I wrote a tweet about it because I could use my thumb, and then a virtual assistant reached out to me so ah. I could still do things. And I was like, oh, I've never thought about that before. You know, it, that was a, like a limiting mindset I had of, well, I'm not important enough to have an assistant, so yeah, I'm yeah. going to do it all myself. And then I'm like, actually, I need one now. Mm. Let's see where this goes. And it opens up your mind and it opens up opportunities, you know, and COVID was a big thing for everybody, but we learned to navigate around that and, and adjust and be flexible and figure it out. So it's just the, it's just the, the challenges of life, just trying to figure them out and how to get around them. We can't always, you know, we're not always responsible for our situations, but we are responsible for how we react to them. Yeah. You know, Agreed. that COVID wasn't our fault. None, none of the cost of living, none of that's our fault, but it is our responsibility to deal with it and yeah. figure it out, even if it's not fair. It feels horrible, it feels unfair, and it is. We've just got to figure a way around it. And trying to control those bits within that that we have control over and those bits that we don't mm. just letting those go and not yeah not yeah. overcomplicating it yeah it's hard mm. but it's the only way and what would you say you know advice for for listeners viewers um who are currently stuck they can't get from where they currently are to where they want to be what advice would you give to somebody 
first of all, is that really where you want to be? Because a lot of people think they want to be in a certain place. Like, I yeah, want to be yeah, the CEO. True. I want to be mm. a millionaire. I want to live here. But, you know, I think when they look inside, if that doesn't light them up, it's not their passion. Maybe they're just doing it because they think that's what they should be doing. So really, yeah. uh, first of all, just make sure that it's truly what it is that you want to do and, and the direction you'll be going in. And then, you know, it's not always a bad thing to take a little bit of a break. You know, we're overwhelmed with information nowadays with, with phones and email. Everything's pinging and ponging all the time. <laughs> Sometimes just to put on airplane mode, take a day off and just let your brain decompress. And then I, I always find, I think a lot of people do this, like the weirdest answers come to you when you're in the shower yeah. or you're driving. I'm constantly hitting a little button on my steering wheel going, Siri, take a note. And I'm sh talking into my phone because these things just come to me. Yeah, You know, like I'm trying to get to this point and I've got a mental block and I stumble it and I can't figure something out and then it just hits me when in that moment of silence. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. So, yeah. you know, just take some time out, decompress a little bit and then just let it come to you, whatever, whatever's blocking to get to that next bit. Just let it come. And all the other things we said earlier, make sure you've got a goal, make sure you've got a plan, make sure you've got the right people around you. Don't be afraid to ask for help as well. Agreed. You know, yeah, a lot yeah. of people think they've got to be the the lone samurai and, and do it themselves, you know. People see it as a weakness for some reason. I don't know. You no, know, and this this is something I've learned a lot from Rob from consuming his content and being around his his groups is mm. you know, outsource all the things that you're rubbish at and the things that you're not that you don't like doing, if you can, if you have the the money to do it or you, the resources you can call in a favor, just outsource it. Yeah. And it's such a good feeling. Like I'm gonna drive home in a minute for four hours. And it's such a good feeling to know that I can send one email in a minute. And that four hours that I'm driving, I'm actually listening to Rob's book right now. Uh, so I'll be listening, finishing off his book, driving home. I'll have an hour of, of headspace where I can start dictating ideas in my phone. And the whole time I'm doing it, my virtual assistant's doing stuff for Stuff's me back at home. Done. Yeah, and yeah, and, yeah. and, and, and you, it's just like, you get 10 extra time. Mm. It's, it's brilliant. Um, you can become so much more productive and efficient. But just at, you got to reach out sometimes and ask for help. That was the first thing uh, when I started in business um, back in 2009. Um, and that was working with an organization, an American organization that helps um, fitness professionals. And it was only when I got um, them put on my radar that I re realized, I don't know why I didn't realize that before, I suppose, but that... You know, you didn't just have to be that that hamster in the wheel. You could take that step back and get other people yeah. to do those other things. And for me, it was the same thing. It was it was getting an assistant, a personal assistant, to help. And it was that yeah. first feeling of being able to to delegate stuff, to let stuff go, mm -hmm. and see stuff grow. First time I think I went on holiday, and having the message, you know, I phoned back in on the first day that we were in Tenerife or whatever, and it was just like that. Put the phone away. Yeah, do not call back. Yeah. Everything's being looked after, and you just. You know, physically, I think my shoulders dropped five yeah. inches. You know, yeah. it's like, wow, okay, this is a nice feeling yeah. to have. Richard Branson doesn't fly his own planes. Do you correct, know what I mean? correct, <laughs> so, correct. Yeah. You know, let it go. <laughs> Very true. Um, are you currently where you want to be? No, never will be. Never will be. I'm all, that's what keeps me excited, is yeah. constantly striving. You know, these next 10 years of my life are dedicated to uh, business. You know, it's something I'm still very uncomfortable talking about is money and finances. Mm -hmm. But I've spent the last 15, 16 years fundraising for charities, you know, making money for other people stupidly yeah, yeah. for some reason. Mm -hmm. And and now, you know, again, you know, in and around entrepreneurs circles a lot more. I see how other people operate. I see the success that they have. I see their mindset shifts. Mm -hmm. And I actually see, you know, I think in this country we have this big, almost like a dark cloud that hangs over the, the topic of money. Yeah. But when you see the good that some people do with it, that have a lot of it, you know, I was talking earlier to someone about that that YouTube guy, Mr. Beast, that my son watches. Uh, yeah, yeah. Does so much cool stuff with his money. Like mm -hmm. I've watched him on Halloween give out iPhones instead of sweets, and then he gave a house away. And I'm like, that would be so cool. Especially because in the world that I operate in, in, in the veteran community, there are so many people that need it. Do you know what I mean? I'd love to be able to just, I say I would love to, I'm, this is what I'm going to do over the next 10 years is earn a ridiculous amount of money and just do some good work with it. 
Love that. You know what I mean? Yeah. Um, Rob's got a good book on money, which you probably read. Read it. Read it. Okay. Listen, I listened to it. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah Tony Robbins. Yeah, um, got it. And then I'm currently uh, Ramit Sethi. I don't know if you follow no, him. Not that one. Uh, I, and I knew of him, and then I heard him on Dara of a CEO, and I was just like, right, I need, my, I need my kids to listen to this as well. And it's literally just like, you okay. know, percentages that you're apportioning to money and, you know, spend lavishly on the things that you love and cut back mercilessly on the things. Um, that, that you don't yeah. but you're still paying for you know it's, you know what I know we're going off on a little bit of a tangent now <laughs> I'm good at that but I, I love this like listening to Tony Tony Robbins and Rob and then so I listened to all this about five years ago maybe and I started actually implementing it mm, that's the key and it's insane <laughs> like you don't learn this stuff at school no. things about compound interest and investing and all this stuff and I'm like and now I'm watching it happening in my own life and I've been watching it stack and stack and stack for years and years in the background I'm mm. like everyone needs to know this it's what I'm trying to teach to my kids Yeah. Like, and it doesn't mean you have to live like a monk and you can't have fun exactly you, you can you absolutely can this is what I was one of the things I was talking to my daughter about on the phone last night but it's like it blows your mind. Like, why does everybody not know this? Why is everybody not doing this and living a bit more freer? Yeah. Why you is know? it kept from us at yeah. school? Or, yeah. You know, and, and that, you know, compounding um, can be applied to, to any area in, in, in your life, yeah. you know, um, and, and money being one of them. And, uh, you know, he was talking on the podcast, Ramit Sethi, and he was saying, you know, if you literally saved, uh, you know, 5% of your money from when you were 16 doing your, um, you know, uh, waitressing or whatever it might be that like my daughter just started, you know, with summer job as, as a waitress. If you, if you saved that amount of money by the time, you know, you got to retirement age, you know, and if you j just invested it in the, in the S and P, it just tracked the S and P. Um, and, and it was a, a you know, 6% return on your investment. And, you know, as you grow older, that 5% becomes more mm -hmm. money, et cetera. He said, and it was nuts. I, you know, I'd never worked this out. It was something ridiculous, like 17 million pounds. Yeah. If you did nothing else other than put that percentage of your income, yeah. you're like, why isn't everybody taught oh, no. in school oh, no. when, before you go and get your first job, when you're all, you know, around that GCSE level or even earlier, yeah. you know. Have you seen the, the golf example where you bet one penny on each hole? No. So it was, I'm not going to try and do the maths of it, but basically it's an example of compound. It says, we'll pay, we'll play the first hole for a penny and then every hole after we'll double it. Right, right. So yeah, you've got okay. to imagine like me and you are playing and I win every hole. So I get a penny, then two pence, then four pence, then eight pence, then 16. By the end, by eight, the eighth hole, I think it's 36,000 pounds. And I'm like, <laughs> oh, wow. that was like really off my eyes yeah. of the power of compounding. How so, did that happen? Yeah, I just started listening and then and implementing bit by bit to uh, to you get this machine up and running in the background, just churning it away all the time. Yeah. And then it becomes, when you see it working, you're like, oh, I've got an extra hundred quid there. <whistles> slide it in there. Yeah, exactly. slide, I'm not going to go waste it on yeah. you know, a T-shirt or whatever it is. I'm going to slide it into the, into the machine and let it do its thing. Yeah. No, it's, it's, it's yeah, like the, the eighth wonder of the world, isn't it? Mm. Compounding. Yeah. Um, okay, let me finish up with this then, Mark. Um, what was the one thing that you needed to be able to, you know, take that attitude which you clearly embody of, you know, being able to screw it, just do it and get from where you were to where you want to be. And that, that one thing could be a quality, it could be a quote, it could be somebody you've met. Um, difficult question to ask, I know, but has there been one kind of constant thing? A vision. That's what it is. I have a lot of mentors, you know, like, like maybe several for each area of my life. We're talking about money now. So we talk about Rob, or Tony Robbins, or these people. In fitness, it's other people. In maybe the speaking world, it's other people. And I just, I take a bit from each of them. It's almost like if you had a, a silhouette of me here, it's like I take a bit of that, put it in me, take a bit of that, and then I create a vision for who I want to be in, in all the areas of my life that are important to me. And that's what keeps me moving forward all the time to try and create that vision. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, like no, a little I, bit, little bit. I of love everything. it. Yeah, I, I, I think you, 
you're ultimately lost with, with, without a vision. You, you, you're doing that thing. You're just going through the motions, aren't you? And you're getting life dictated to mm. you rather than you being proactive. Um, and there's no reason why not, as, as you say, with the resources that we have today and the opportunities that you can you can search out or let them come to you if you if you've got your eyes yeah. open and your ears open. It's crazy. I just I, I love it. I just imagine myself at a certain age, still fit and healthy, with a six pack with a huge success in my career when I've hit all those financial goals and then everyone to be like how is this guy fit healthy wealthy successful and and I just explain I write a whole book on the thing and say look anyone can do this I did it with with four fingers and a thumb do you know what I mean mm. so anyone can do it how often do you I'm just to dive into that time a little bit more how often do you work on that vision how often do you reflect back on that vision every morning <laughs> Every morning at quarter past go. five, when the alarm goes off, is the first thing I do. It's hop on the floor, 15, 20 minutes meditation, visualization of what mm. I want my life to look like. Then I go into my day. Love it. Give me some advice here. The, the one thing I struggle with, so I'm, I'm good at vision, I'm good at planning, goal setting. I really struggle with visualization. Any, any tips on visualization? Visualization of what? Your goals. How are you going to get there? How do you take yourself? Do you put yourself in that kind of a meditative state then by doing meditation? And when you're in that kind of zone, um, you're able to kind of see it, smell it, feel it, hear it? Yes, exactly. Okay. This is what I was okay. going to say. I, I fast forward into time and almost right. and I, like, like it's happened now. Like it is happening now. Okay. And I can feel the feeling. I get the goosebumps and I, I, I'm living in it in my mind in the moment. Got it. And then, okay. you know, I, I don't want to go too <laughs> mess out the rabbit hole about the law of attraction and stuff, but yeah, yeah. It, it's funny when you see that kind of stuff in action, like the opportunities it creates. Like you walk into a room and your energy just attracts the right people yeah, and the right opportunities. You know what I mean? You're, you're true to yourself. We'll talk about values again. Mm. You know, you attract those things that you value. You know, it's crazy. Yeah. And it took me, you got to bear in mind, it took me a long time to get here. I've been a big, hairy, smelly Royal Marines commando to then, you know, talk the way I do now. It's taken yeah, okay. me, it's been a journey to get here. But, mm. you know, every morning I do that and it just sets me up for the day. And I, I genuinely believe it creates opportunities. I agree. Mm. Yeah, 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 yeah. No, I appreciate that. that that's, that's really good, really good advice. Um, and yeah, what, one hell of a story. Um, in, inspiring, obviously. Um, people want to connect with you. People want to um, read about you, uh, your book. You need to get some more copies in stock, I know. Look at the I've website. got a couple at home. Um, man. I'm writing another one at the minute. Are you? Yeah. Okay. It's, one a, it's one of these projects I've had a lot of no's about. Yeah. Um, follow autobiography. So hopefully I'll have that done towards the end of the year. But I'm all over social media, like pretty much every platform, TikTok, yep. Instagram, LinkedIn, X, Facebook. We are eight. I don't do Snapchat, but yeah, pretty much anywhere. Amazing. Uh, well, look, Mark Ormer, thank you so much for your time. Really appreciate it, man. My pleasure. Thanks for watching this episode of Screw It, Just Do It. Let me know what you thought of it in the comments below this video. Has this episode helped move you closer to where you want to be? All that I ask is that if you enjoyed this episode and that it's moved you closer to getting to where you want to be, that you share this episode so that it helps one other person do just the same. Just ask yourself what small action will move you forward to get you from where you are, then screw it and just do it. Until next time.